the book of Colossians. We're going to be starting our series in Colossians. And uh, I don't know what I've done with. All right, so somebody will have to tell me when it's over because I've left my phone somewhere. <laughs> oh, well, I'm preaching my voice runs out, which probably won't be long. I apologize for my, um, my voice this morning. I'm getting over uh, a little bit of the crud, so it's all right here, but uh, I think I'll be okay. Colossians chapter 1, you have in your handout this morning uh, an introduction to the book of Colossians, just uh, like to put that out occasionally if, uh, to help out a little bit, uh, to help introduce you to the book, and that way you can get, know it a little bit. I've always found having that little bit of background information helps interpret what's happening in the book and, and move forward in your own personal reading. So I just put that in there. But today we're going to talk about the first eight verses. I want to speak with you about faithful messengers and the faithful message. Faithful messengers and the faithful message. Look with me in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the, gospel, in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is, bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do ask that you would grant us understanding of your word, that we might be blessed and strengthened, and our hearts and minds enlightened in the things of Christ, that we might see that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to have the confidence and faith and the word of God and the message of the gospel to accomplish the things that you have sent it to do. May our trust not be in anything else, but in Christ alone, and in his gospel alone, and in the word of God alone, for the glory of God alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Colossians, uh, as you'll see in your introduction, was a very small town. It had been a lot more important earlier in its history but by the time Paul writes this letter, Colossians is uh, in decline as a city. It, uh, the travel routes have changed. And of course, as you know, even we can witness here in Lexington, a lot of times growth happens where the roads cross, you know, where, where travel and transport and commerce happens is where people, where things spring up. And so, you know, we've got lots of highways here. We've got lots of railroad travel and so forth because of all the factories that used to be here. And so Lexington grew up right in the middle of that. Well, in a lot of ways, Colossae is the same way. It was, a, it was on the travel route as goods and services and people were traveling through, this city began to grow. But as sometimes happens the travel route switched. And over time, Colossae began to be skipped and people began to go through Ephesus or Heropolis, uh, Philippi and some of the other cities and not through Colossae. So at this time, when Paul writes this letter, the city's in decline. But there's still people there. It's by and large a Gentile city. 
but there's still a significant population of Jews uh, in Colossae at this time. And we'll find out, too, that the Apostle Paul, there's some debate here, but the Apostle Paul probably never visited Colossae, even though he is attributed as the founder of the church. You say, well, how's that possible? Well, because Paul spent three years in Ephesus, which is near here, near Colossae. And it appears, and we have no way of knowing for sure, but it appears that Epaphras, the man I just read his name, Epaphras uh, apparently must have been in Ephesus at one time, heard the Apostle Paul preach, was saved, and then went home to Colossae. While he's in Colossae, he begins to share his newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Other people begin to believe. Other, uh, once more people believe, the next thing you know, there is a church that begins to blossom and grow in that city. And so Paul now writes to this church even though he himself has never been there. But indirectly, Paul is the founder of this church. And so that's all. It's, and, and the more we study through the book of Colossians, the more these things will be important to us because Paul refers to his relationship to them. And we also find out uh, some of the issues that are facing the Colossian church. The Colossian church was a young church. It was filled with new believers, new in the faith, and new to the challenge of walking in Christianity, and believing in Christ and the challenges that go with that. And already, even as a new congregation, they were already threatened with false teaching. And so... The book of Colossians has this double emphasis. One is teaching young Christians how to grow up in Christ and the essentials of genuine Christianity. And then the other emphasis is distinguishing false teaching and knowing how to avoid it and not be a part of it. And so in Colossians, there is this constant contrast between genuine Christ or genuine Christianity and the counterfeits, those that are want to add, and his, this would be the key words here, those who want to add something to Christianity. Those that we might say, uh, say, well, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but you also need whatever. Whatever you want to put in that blank. Now, the particular heresy in Colossae, we're going to find out. There were some certain things being put in that blank. Angel worship, special days, obedience to the law, circumcision. So there was, all, there was quite a few different things that were being put in that blank. You need to believe in Jesus Christ and such and such, whatever that is. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter to them and you'll see very quickly, if you continue with me here in Colossians, even, very quickly in chapter 1, we see that Paul rushes to the preeminence of Christ. Paul is quick to get to the preeminence of Christ because he wants them to understand right out of the gate that Christian belief, Christian Christianity, true genuine faith is in Jesus Christ alone through Jesus Christ alone. Of course, he's Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He says that right here at the very first, doesn't he? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but he's saying that Christ is the way to God. Jesus is the way to God, plus nothing. And to add anything to that is to begin to depart or to depart from the faith of Jesus Christ. And so we start out at the beginning, and I, I think it's in, in interesting. Uh, it may sound just like a greeting, and it is a greeting. But it's easy for us to say, well, you know, all this first little few verses and the, first, and the last few verses are just, hello, everybody, and goodbye, everybody, and just dismiss those. But 
that would be a mistake because we have to remember this is Holy Scripture. This is inspired by the Holy Spirit. There's no word, there are no words in here that are superfluous. There are no words in here that we don't need or that we can just skip over. They all mean something. And we'll notice as we move through these first eight verses, there are some patterns. There are some things that Paul is already emphasizing. Paul is already on task, in, even in the introduction, to setting the people at Colossae, the Christians at Colossae, correctly. To get them, getting them on the right path as new believers. And of course, why would we expect any difference when such profound belief and doctrine is being taught in such a small amount of space? Could you and I write on such a compact level? I don't think I could. And yet the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, does. And so with such a small amount of space, we need to understand God is using every word. He's using every sentence, every phrase to communicate something of importance that you and I need. And so let me say that today we'll be talking about faithful messengers and a faithful message. We could add in there the faithful membership, which is the, the next part of, of what we'll talk about today. But let me just start right out of the gate to say this. We, Colossae was a small church, a new church, in a small town, in a dying town. But let me say this. Do not underestimate the power of a faithful biblical congregation. Do not underestimate the power of a faithful biblical congregation. This church that we just described, a small church, a young church, in a small town, in a dying town, received a letter from the Apostle Paul and was included in the canon of Scripture. This church was important. And it needed correct teaching. And so we need to be careful that we understand that it is important who we are in Christ. Our identity of, as believers and as a congregation is important. What we do, who we are, what we believe is vital to the mission of the gospel in our age. So the most influential church in my life personally I say never underestimate the power of a biblical faithful church I would say one of the, at least one I, I don't know if it's the but the one of the the most influential churches in my life was Pleasant Garden Baptist Church in Pleasant Garden North Carolina anybody know where Pleasant Garden is okay we got a couple here right outside of Greensboro I have to say that was probably one of the most influential time the churches in, in, in my life. Pastor Mike Barrett was the pastor there. He just recently retired, I think, this past, past year. So he's been pastoring or was pastoring Pleasant Garden Baptist Church up until last year, my whole, my whole ministry, honestly. And uh, the good man... I recall that the church was a Bible-believing church, a friendly church, an accepting church. The music was always a tremendous blessing. My Sunday school teacher visited me twice before we uh, actually joined the church, or visited Lori and me. Pastor Barrett was, uh, was a, big, a big influence in my life. He took me, you know, we went there at a difficult time in our life. Uh, we, had all, we were already Christians, but we were getting, being called into the ministry. There was a lot of transition. We had newly married, all these things. And Pastor Barrett took me under, under his wing and began to mentor me and, and invest in me, which I've never taken for granted. And I believe helped me in so many ways. He was a, an expositional preacher. 
I still remember that he was preaching through the book of Acts when we began to visit the church. And he was preaching verse by verse through the book of Acts. I still remember that. I may even have some of his notes somewhere. But Pastor Mike was an expository preacher. He believed in the Word of God. He stood firm on it. The church, after we left, uh, we, when we were there, it was, I don't know, about 500, I guess. But we went off to college to train for the ministry. And I, I think it, it just probably doubled or tripled in size uh, after that. And God's just done wonderful things through that church. And that church, I would say, was a lot like this church in Colossae. It had faithful messengers. It had faithful members. And they believed and taught the faithful message. That's what you see in these first eight verses. You see those three essential components of every gospel-centered, Bible-centered church. And if those things aren't there, then somewhere there's a problem. And that's what Paul starts out of the gate. He emphasizes biblical leadership. He emphasizes biblical membership. He emphasizes a biblical message. And whether or not a church has beautiful auditoriums or facilities or campus if it has the greatest programs and the biggest budgets whether or not it has all those things quite honestly is secondary if it does not have these things then it's most lacking and quite honestly there are churches that have all of the above but do not have one or more of these right here and that's a scary thing because these are the three essential elements of having a biblical church, a faithful messengers, faithful members, and biblical uh, believing and teaching a faithful message, the message of the gospel. And that's what we see here. So first, let's look. Faithful messengers. What do we mean by that? Well, look in verse 1 and in verse 7. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now look in verse 7. He refers to the, the third one, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So what do we have here? We have three faithful messengers mentioned in these first eight verses, or first seven verses actually, but we have three faithful messengers, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Well, what, what is an apostle? Have you ever asked that question? Don't we do that in Christianity? Church life? We, use three, we bandy words about and we don't even know what they mean. Or we don't stop to, to say, well, what is, why is this person an apostle and this person is not referred to as an apostle? What does that mean? Well, in a truly biblical sense... Our faith is apost what we could say apostolic in the sense that the apostles were given the teaching of Jesus Christ and they wrote it down and, was and it was transferred to us. So what is an apostle? Well, we could say first that there were originally only 12 apostles appointed by Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 says, The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew. There's the Bartholomew again. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, son of the, the, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. And so, we have twelve apostles apostles appointed personally by Jesus Christ. So we have a limited number there, don't we? Unlike some today who continue to claim apostolic positions. Maybe you've even met some. You know, this is brother so-and-so. He is the apostle of our church. Well, not according to the Bible. Because according to the Bible, there were only 12. Okay? So I'm not an apostle. I'm a pastor. Neither can I be an apostle. Neither can any other pastor or 
reverend or doctor or any of those things can be an apostle. An apostle is appointed by Jesus Christ himself. And there were originally only 12. Judas, secondly, we need to remember that Judas betrayed Jesus. The 11 appointed Matthias, remember him? And Christ added Paul. So there we go. Judas betrayed Jesus. So Judas, we, we would mark him out. So now we're down to 11. Okay? The 11, then, remember, they prayed and fasted and sought the Lord, cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, so they chose Matthias. Some question whether that's legitimate. I do not. I believe that's legitimate. They were apostles. They prayed. They fasted. They sought the Lord. The Lord showed them. They appointed Matthias to be number 12 in uh, Judas's place. Okay? So we're still at 12. Notice they didn't say, hey, guys. Why don't we add 13 or 14? Why don't we add 15 or 20? You know, hey, if we have more apostles, we get more done. No, they cast lots and chose one more. Why? Because Jesus chose 12. And they, they knew they did not have the right to add to that. They had the right by God, the appointment by God, to replace the traitor, Judas. Okay? And then Jesus himself confronts the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. The Apostle Paul is on his way to arrest Christians and put them in prison. And Jesus himself, in a blinding light, shines face to face to the Apostle Paul. And Jesus says, Saul, which was his original name, why are you persecuting me? So Paul is face to face with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And at that time, Jesus, Paul was repented and believed in Jesus Christ, and Christ appointed him as the last apostle. Okay? So there, there are 13 apostles, because, and Paul even says, I was one born out of due season. In other words, I was appointed late as an apostle. But notice he opens the book by saying what? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That's not just throwing words around. That is setting up his authority from the very first verse. He is saying, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ our Lord, our God, whom we worship, and I'm an apostle by the will of God, not by the will of men. Because you can't be an apostle by the will of men. Okay? The church can't appoint an apostle. Jesus appoints apostles. And so, we are here and we find out that Paul, in Galatians 1.1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so that's what an apostle is. So Paul is a faithful messenger of the gospel. That's what the word, the, the word apostle means. It means a sent one. One who is specifically sent on a message. A mission with a message. Okay? The word apostle literally is sort of like missionary. Now they're not the same. But it carries the idea of someone who's sent with a message. Now... The apostles were Jesus, this is why there's only 13. They were Jesus' specifically chosen representatives to go speak for him. Okay? So they hold, they hold extra or held extra authority in the life of the church. Notice if you read the epistles, uh, Paul at different times says, I will come and straighten that out. So Paul is saying, I'm, an, I'm, the, I'm the apostle. I will be there and I'll straighten that out. He has the authority. He speaks for Christ. Okay, I don't have that. The only way I speak for Christ is if I'm accurate when I read this Bible to you and, and preach this word. Okay? That's when Christ speaks through me is when I'm accurate, accurately preaching the word of God. But the apostle Paul 
and all the apostles had that apostolic authority. All right? So he's a faithful messenger. Timothy, our brother. Who is Timothy? Timothy's a young pastor. He is, Paul is mentoring him. Timothy's not an apostle, but he is a young pastor. We have, Paul wrote two letters to him, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And Paul encouraged him and taught him how to be a pastor. In fact, that was the, the passage, our scripture reading this morning came out of Timothy, and that's why. Then we have Epaphras. And although all indications are that Paul never visited the church personally, he did found it indirectly. And it seems that while Paul was in the nearby Ephesus that uh, 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 approximately three years, that Epaphras was saved during that time. Epaphras is a, is a model pastor in that he traveled, get this, a thousand miles on foot to give Paul an update of the church. Think about that. He said, he said, Epaphras is a faithful minister. He has told us of your love in the Spirit. Well, it's easy for us when we're just reading the Bible. We don't have the map in our minds. But when we realize Paul was imprisoned in Rome, Epaphras was from Colossae, Epaphras traveled to Rome to update the Apostle Paul and serve him, which was a thousand miles away. Now, which one of us is ready to embark out here today and walk a thousand miles to help another minister and give him an update on how the church is doing? Does doctrine mean that much to you? Epaphras was worried about the church. He was concerned that the church was going in the wrong direction, that they were leaving Christ. He cared about the apostolic teaching so much that he walked a thousand miles one way to update the Apostle Paul, and therefore we have the book of Colossians. It was written and taken back to the church to be read by him. So we see that, uh, that Epaphras was, as he says, as you have learned from Epaphras. Epaphras was a teacher of the gospel. Our dear fellow servant, he was a servant of the gospel. Declared unto us your love. He loved the church in the gospel. And he was faithful minister of Christ. He was faithful to the gospel. This is a faithful messengers. This is what it means to be faithful messengers. He was a teacher of the gospel. He was a servant of the gospel. He was a, a lover of the church in the gospel. And he was faithful to the gospel. And every church must have that or it won't go forward. This church had three men of God at least. Which we're going to read, I think, about several more as we go into the book. Uh, that, that this church had three right here that are mentioned. And there are more that are mentioned. Faithful ministers of the gospel in their midst. Not necessarily ordained. I'm not saying, I'm saying these were lay people and others that carried the message, that were faithful to teach it and to, and to uphold it and to live by it. But it is important that, that the teaching ministry of the church, we might say the official teaching and preaching and uh, pulpit ministry of the church, be right. Dr. David Hall says this concerning the plight of the modern church. You know, there are many today that would say that, th that what I'm doing is outdated, that we shouldn't be preaching anymore. We need to do something different. Well, Dr. David Hall says this in his book called The Arrogance of the Modern, says concerning the plight of the modern church and how to reanimate the church for Christ, he writes, preaching must be re-elevated. Preaching must be given a renewed place in the life of any church that hopes to reach our culture. I believe that with all my heart. Why? Because that's exactly what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. In season, out of season. Now what does that mean? It means there are going to be times when people don't want to hear it. 
there are going to be times when they do want to hear it. What do you do, Timothy? You just keep preaching. Okay? A faithful messenger. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Paul the apostle, remember we said about apostles? They carry Christ's authority. Paul the apostle tells young Timothy the pastor, I charge you. I charge you. Before God, who will judge the living and the dead, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, and do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Faithful messengers. Faithful members is number two. Faithful members. Notice what he says in verses 2 through 3. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers, in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace from God our Father. Now there's three words here referred to the membership of Colossae that I believe you and I as Christians and church people need to internalize. We need to digest because it is important that we understand our identity in Jesus Christ. And that is, number one, you see, he calls them saints. He calls them saints. Notice, they are still living. They received the letter. They have not died. They have not been canonized. These are living people who have believed in Jesus Christ, and they are called saints, or holy ones, literally. That's the literal translation. Holy ones. They are holy. Why? Because they live perfect lives? Because they never sin? They never do anything wrong? No. Because they know God through Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. They have confessed their sins, repented of their sins, and trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ has been applied to their account by faith. And so God declares that they are now forgiven. And they are now holy or set apart. Okay, Holy mean, also means to be set apart. When we make something holy, and even in the Old Testament, they would bless the water or whatever it means to be set apart it's not for common use the set apart bread the holy bread remember we read that well David went into the tabernacle and he took the holy bread well, why was it holy because it had been prayed over and dedicated to God it had been set aside as part of the worship okay well that same thing is what's true of those of us who are in Jesus Christ. We have been set aside as Christ's people. It doesn't mean we're sinless. It means we are forgiven. It means we are uniquely His. We are His people, His church, chosen out of all humanity to be His worshipers. Okay? Saints. Holy ones. Doesn't mean sanctimonious. It means to be set apart to Jesus. That's what it means. Number two, faithful brothers. Faithful brothers, or brothers and sisters, we might say. And so he says, to the saints and faithful brothers. Now the Greek word is adelphos, which means brothers, but adelphos 
is also the word that's generally like mankind. It's the word for mankind. We use the word on air, it means man, man, male. And Adel Foss can mean man and women. It means mankind. And that's what he's saying here. Faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And what does he mean by faithful? You see, that's where I'm getting the words, don't you? What does he mean by that? They are faithful in that they have believed the message, the faithful message from God. They are holding to Christ. Yes, they're being tempted by false teaching. Yes, they're struggling with sins, and we're going to find all that out. But at the same time, these folks have believed in Jesus. And therefore, Paul has confidence that they are genuine Christians. They are faithful, faithful to Jesus and faithful to the message. And he says, in Christ, believing, believing. They believe in Jesus Christ. What does it mean? What, what does it mean to be a member of the church? What is the, what, what is the criteria? Is it all the social ills that, you know, does the church need to, you know, be the protector of this and that and so forth? No. The church is Christ's. Redeemed. Believes in Christ. Holds to Christ's gospel. That's the point. That's why we exist. And we should never allow ourselves to be hijacked and used by a political party, any political party, or social issues, or anything else. We should preach Christ's righteousness. And, you know, if that, somebody else agrees with that, wonderful. If they don't, let them be corrected. But the church of Christ, Paul says to Timothy, is the pillar and the ground of the truth. We have the authority to speak God's word to our generation. In fact, we are not, don't, not only have the authority, we have the calling upon us to stand out and speak those things from God's word. And not to speak them as a mouthpiece for some human organization. But to speak them in faithfulness to Christ. We must... We have, we've come to a time, unfortunately, when some have convinced themselves that one does not have to be holy or faithful or believing to be a Christian or to even be a church. Now, this is a false teaching, and it's dangerous. Not everything that has a steeple is a church. I know that's hard to accept. But there are a lot of organizations that may have one day been a church that is no longer a church. But a church of Jesus Christ, a legitimate church, holds these elements, these faithfulness of the gospel. As we saw last week, where Luther said, where there's the, the word of God is preached, and those who cherish it and live in it, there is the gospel. There is the church. And many times in places around the world, the church might be there, but there are no buildings or steeples or anything like that. What determines a church where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says. There am I in the midst of them. What does that mean? That means I am uniquely present with those who are faithful to my word. That, I, that all, The reverse is true as well. He is uniquely absent from those who forsake his word. And the Old Testament is filled with warnings from God Almighty to, to the people of Israel. He says, your offerings stink to me. Do I, am I satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats? We saw last Sunday night, God said to them in Deuteronomy, you have not worshipped me with joy and gladness, and therefore I do not listen to you. I'm not present with you. 
So we can have all kinds of ceremony. And God be nowhere near it. So we need to be careful that we have faithful messengers, faithful members. Listen to Peter's words. Therefore, 1 Peter chapter 1, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds and conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that, notice our life here is called an exile. Did you notice that? Remember we talked about the pilgrim life? Just throw that out. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are steadfast in God. That's what he's saying. And then lastly, we see a faithful message. Look in verse 14, uh, 4 through 6. A faithful message, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. In fact, look, go back to three. We also thank God the Father our, of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. See, that's what we're talking about. They're new believers. He says, we have given thanks for you because we have come to find out that you have believed in Jesus and we give thanks to God every time we hear about that and the love that you have for all the saints. You notice that that love for fellow genuine believers is an evidence of genuine salvation. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of uh, this you have heard from, the, from before, heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. What's the word of truth? The gospel. Which has come to you as it indeed is. And now here I want you to listen. When I read this, notice what's... You know, I used to say, Scott, don't make me do English. I'm sorry, okay? Just for one minute, all right? I want you to put your English hat on. All right? I'm sorry but you'll, you'll be blessed just for, just for a minute. Notice the, what's accomplishing all of the action in these few verses. He says in verse 5, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you as indeed into the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth or in reality just as you have learned it from Epaphras our fellow what's accomplishing all this methods the gospel the gospel he says notice that the gospel is doing this in you and the gospel is spreading throughout the world and the gospel is what's bringing people to God we have the gospel of Jesus Christ and if we the church ever abandon that quite honestly we have nothing the greatest thing we have to give to this world, the best thing we could ever give to this world, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God, Paul says, unto salvation to everyone that believes. It's the gospel that's the power of God. Paul says the gospel is doing all this work. The gospel is the truth in verse 5. The gospel is worldwide, verse 6. The gospel is fruitful in verses 6 through 8. Think about that. The gospel, what is truth? 
we live in a generation that says, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. Don't put your truth over my truth. Well, the gospel, the Bible says the gospel is the truth. Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? But Jesus had already answered that question, hadn't he? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Beloved, that truth is relative, is a lie. Okay? There is a such thing as truth. There is a such thing as reality. The gospel is worldwide. Notice that. He says, as it's bearing fruit around the world. The gospel did not, <clears throat> excuse me, the gospel did not stay in Jerusalem. The gospel did not stay in Colossae. The gospel did not stay in Europe. The gospel did not stay in, it does not stay in America. The gospel is bearing fruit right now all around the world. We have brothers and sisters in Christ from every point in the globe. It's a beautiful thing. And that's why we see in the book of Revelation it says that, that men and women from every tribe and kindred and tongue praising God. The kingdom of God is drawing people from every nation under the globe, on the globe. The gospel is worldwide. The gospel is fruitful. The gospel bears fruit. You say, well, Scott, I, you know, I'm not, I, I know everybody probably has spiritual gifts as a Christian, but I, I, don't, I don't really feel like I have many gifts, and, I, and therefore I can't really bear fruit. What bears fruit? The gospel. So if you live according to the gospel and you share the gospel, then what will happen? You will bear fruit. There's the answer, isn't it? The gospel. So every local congregation is called to be faithful to the master, faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our king and rules us through his word. We, we need these, we must have these, every church, not just Colossae, but the, every church must have these three elements. Faithful messengers, faithful members, and the faithful message. If we don't have anything else and we have those, we've got everything we need. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the precious word that is so clear to us. And Lord, we do live in a time that, and as all times, I guess, that push on us, push on, the, on, on our beliefs. But I pray, Lord, rather than just bemoaning that all the time, that we would find our peace in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would live with joy and gladness, and that we might understand that the only reason those that push against the gospel is because they don't know the gospel, they don't believe the gospel. They haven't experienced Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to be those messengers, to share the love of Christ with them, to show them the truth that's in Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be that faithful people. As you call them in Colossae, so you call us as well. We pray for grace and faithfulness to be uh, true to your word and to your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you will take your hymnal.